Well, greetings and welcome back to another Prophetic Insights. I know that it's been a while and I apologize for that. But when we closed out our last Prophetic Insights, we looked at the book of Daniel chapter 9. And so we're going to transfer from the book of Daniel, we're going to move to the book of Revelation. And before we begin, we will start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have given us prophecy for a reason. And I believe that we are living in the end times. And it is because you want your people to be prepared and not to be deceived. And so we thank you for these wonderful books that you've given us. And so I pray that you would help us to have understanding of them, a love of the truth. And Lord, may you bless my mind and my lips to speak. And may your blessings be upon those that would hear. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to begin with the book of Revelation in chapter 12. Now in this chapter, it's kind of a consolidated view of the history of the early church through the close of time. That which took, past, uh, took place in the past, the present, and the future. And so, as we take a look at this, we're not going to unpack all of Revelation 12. Um, there's much that could be said in there. But we'll give you kind of an overview of what we're going to see in the following chapters, 13, 14, and onward. Because this just kind of gives us a summary of what we're going to be looking at in the remaining chapters of the book of Revelation. So let's begin. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, when we study the Bible, we see that a woman in the Bible symbolically represents a church. Now, it can be a good church, or it can be a bad or a false church. Now, this church we see is arrayed with things of light. And we want to look at those. It says that it was clothed with the sun. What does the sun mean? Well, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. This represents Jesus Christ, this light from the sun. His church is clothed with this light, the beautiful adornment of Christ's righteousness. It is the word of God. So it had been blessed with the New Testament. And it goes on to say that the moon was under her feet. Now those of you who have been following along in our prophetic insights, you see that as we covered the book of uh, Daniel chapters 8 and 9, we unpacked a little bit <clears throat> of the sanctuary service because the sanctuary in Psalm 77 13 tells us thy way O God is in the sanctuary in the sanctuary was the way of salvation it was outlining the plan that Jesus would put into place when he come to this earth because in the sanctuary service it was a shadow or a type in other words it reflected the light of Jesus Christ of what Jesus would do for us so in it we saw the plan of salvation for God's people in their time. But once Jesus came to the earth, that salvation, that, that sanctuary um, service was done away with because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we see this moon under her feet. But it also says that it has a crown of 12 stars. And so what do stars mean? It says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. These stars are angels to the seven churches. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, an angel 
means a messenger. Now these stars are messengers to the churches upon this earth. And God has 12 of them. It is symbolic of God's disciples. And so we are to be God's disciples. We are to bear the light of God's word and we are to share that with the world. That's what God's disciples do. And so these 12 stars represent God's people sharing the message, the good news of the gospel. <clears throat> Let's move on in verse two. It says, and she being with child, that is the woman, the church, it says, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This is talking about, again, the New Testament church, which was clothed with the sun or the light of Jesus Christ. This is the time when Jesus' birth was going to be taking place. So this is at the ver very early stages of the Christian church. I should say the New Testament Christian church. God's people were always Christians if they worshipped him. Verses 3 and 4, it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Verse 4, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So here we see in my thoughts, the picture of the great controversy. We see a wonder in heaven, which is God's church, who stand for him and represent him. And the adversary is in opposition to him. Because in verse 9 of this same chapter, it tells us that this great red dragon is the old serpent, the devil, and Satan himself. And so we see the great controversy picture. John is seeing it, and he's going to tell us briefly what this is all about, what's going to happen, and what has happened. We'll get into more details as we move forward. But he sees the devil, he sees God's church in heaven. And so what does he see? He says he sees these seven heads and ten horns. We've discussed some of this in previous uh, studies in Daniel chapter 7, but we're going to look at it in more detail in Revelation chapter 13 in our next study. But these heads and these horns represent systems and powers that Satan has worked through in history and is working through now even to overcome God's people. And it says that his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Now these stars of heaven, again, the stars represent angels, but these angels are heavenly angels. And we're going to look at this more in the next few verses, what this means. But it says his tail, what does a tail mean? In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 15, it says, The ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. So someone who teaches lies is the tail. And in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh it of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. All lies come from Satan. And this tale represents, it was through his lies and through his deceptions that he was able to sweep one third of the angels from heaven to this earth. How careful should we be if he could sweep that many away of perfect human beings? First John chapter two, verse four says, he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Brothers and sisters, this is dangerous because it says, if we say we know him and keep not his commandments, we are liars. And in John 17, three, it says, and this is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So in order to have life eternal, it says we must know him. And it says that if we say we know him and keep not his commandments, we're liars. And so, brothers and sisters, God's law is important, as we're going to see, because we don't want to be liars. 
We want to honor God. It is Satan who is trying to deceive and to do away with God's law. He hated it from the beginning. And we'll see more about that in a bit. Let's go on. Verses 5. It says, And she brought forth a man-child. This was the church. And this is speaking of Jesus Christ. It says, Who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. It says here that Jesus was to rule all nations. And most of the world right now, from what I see, has a misunderstanding of this. Because Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus understood that there were problems in the world. He didn't mingle himself or interfere with the politics of the world. He kept that separate. He said, that's not my kingdom. Jesus came to change the hearts of the people. Because if we can change the hearts of the people, then the things in this world will straighten out. Making laws to govern people's conscience is not going to change things. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Jesus understood that this was a heart matter. This was a spiritual matter. And that's where we need to be, brothers and sisters. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 5, 6, and 7, I'll read that to you. It says, And said unto him, this is God um, speaking to Samuel, the prophet. He says, Behold, thou art old. And thy sons walk not in thy ways. Forgive me, this is God's people speaking to Samuel. Um, but God's going to speak him in the next um, um, verse. But anyway, it says, And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to have a king. It seems strange. They already did have a king and God. God was to be their king. He was to be their ruler. But they had fallen so far away from the faith that they wanted to be like the other nations. In verse 6 it says, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And this is what the Lord said in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. You see, God never intended for people to have kings over them or presidents or anybody to govern over them. He was to govern over them. And so as we allow God to rule in our lives, then we can accomplish the purposes. You won't see of God. You won't see all these things taking place on the earth that you do. People are frustrated and rightly so. But I believe they have been misdirected. And what I'm trying to say is people are trying to bring together church and state. And yet, <clears throat> bringing together church and state, as we will see, is a great mistake. And Jesus also said, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, unto God that which is God's. Jesus was telling us clearly that there is a distinction. You put a difference between that which is God and that which is of this earth. Yes, respect the laws of this land, as long as they don't interfere with our moral decisions in how to worship God, because then we're going past the line and we are placing ourselves before God. And so Christ did not support church and state. And I want to look at that a little more, but let's move on. Verse six says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, <clears throat> where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand and two hundred and three score days. This woman that fled into the wilderness again, this woman is God's true church. And why did she have to flee into the wilderness? Well, we read this in Daniel chapter 7, and we discussed this. It was because of the combination of church and state. The Catholic Church used its influence and power with the kings of the world to cause the population of the world to worship as she saw best. And those who didn't cooperate, they were persecuted, they were put to death by the millions. And this is the result of bringing church and state together. And the Bible says it's going to come together again. And we'll look at that in Revelation chapter 13. But this 1,203 score days, this is 1,260 days, and we discussed this earlier, that in prophetic time, we are considering a day as equal to a year. 
So this 1,260 days is 1,260 years. This correlates with what we found in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25. And we discussed this, who this was speaking of. But I want to read this verse to you again. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. Again, this is the papal power speaking great words against God, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. We have discussed this, because Satan has a throne, and it is the papal seat. Satan hates the commandments of God, and so he influenced the Catholic Church to change the laws of God. Most importantly, from the seventh-day Sabbath, God's seventh-day Sabbath, to the first day of the week, to make it holy, which God never had changed. But it says, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and a dividing of time. Time represents one year. Times represents two years. So we have three years and a dividing of times is half a year. Again, this comes to 1,260 days or three and one half years or 1,260 year time prophecy. And we talked about this. And again, as a reminder, this was the time when the Catholic Church was given power from pagan Rome. They moved out of Rome, the pagan empire, into Constantinople. And when they left, they handed the keys over to the bishops of Rome and gave them power and they gained support from the other ten horns, the ten kingdoms that rose up. France, you know them as Western Europe. And they influenced the kings to um, do their bidding, to do their working. And many of them were converted to Catholicism, so they obeyed. And we are going to see this come again. But this is the time period of God's uh, church being persecuted. That's why they had to flee into the wilderness. And so God's true people had to flee because of this persecution. And, and Jesus speaks of this in Matthew 24, verse 22, as he's speaking prophetically of the future, telling us about the future. And he spoke about this times. He said, and except those days which should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God shortened them. He said in 1798, after 1,260 years, that's enough. We'll discuss these dates more in the next chapter. But again, we have already discussed them, but we need to reiterate them. I also want to touch on one more thing too. Those years, those 1,260 years, were considered the Dark Ages. And they were considered the Dark Ages because the Catholic Church hid the Bibles. They hid that light that we talked about that was shed upon God's church, the sun, the stars. This church was a false church. It hid it from the people because the Catholic Church knew that it would expose who they really are. They are Antichrist. They stand in the place of Christ. So they were the Dark Ages because they hid the word from the people of God. Let's go on. Daniel chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now, many people believe that this all began in the Garden of Eden, but yet it began even before that, and we see that in these verses. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You see, it began in heaven. Lucifer, who is now Satan, the old serpent and the devil, he rebelled against God. He didn't care for the government of God. He thought God's law was unjust, and that it bound people to obedience to him. And so he misrepresented the, the um, government of God to a third of the angels, where we read, already read that he swept them out of heaven to this earth. And I, I have been in a, a uh, Protestant church where um, they were teaching, and this is not just to this church, I've heard it in other churches, teaching that the devil and the angels are not real. And you might wonder, well, I don't believe that, or maybe you do, I don't know, but how would that be an issue? Well, if we don't believe that the devil is real, or that his angels, and we just read here clearly, that Satan was cast out to this earth, and his angels with him, 
it's it would put um, people at ease, I believe, and not weary that we have an enemy amongst us. And I believe we can get lax in our in our preparation, our spiritual preparations to receive God into our hearts. And even beyond that, if we don't believe that the devil exists or his evil angels, because it says here that he deceiveth the whole world, and I believe that the world has accepted many false doctrines that have come out of the mouth of the serpent, out of this, this dragon. And we read in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, he speaks great words against the Most High. How does he do that? Through deceptions, by telling lies. Remember, he's the father of lies. And one of those lies is that he doesn't exist, nor his angels. Another one of those lies is the state of the dead. To believe that we go to heaven or hell when we die is a false doctrine. It's not true. And what would be the problem with that? The problem with that is because there's going to come a time, very soon I believe, that we are told that, that Satan and his angels can impersonate our dead lost loved ones, or saved loved ones, those who have passed away anyway. He can impersonate them. And so he could come in the form of them, looking like them, sounding like them, and he could tell them that we came from heaven and God said this. God said this. God said that. Don't worry about the Sabbath. It's not an issue. Satan will do all that he can to deceive his people. And it's simply because the doctrine, the misunderstanding of the doctrine of the state of the dead. Jesus said clearly when Lazarus died, he said, Lazarus sleepeth. The disciples said, well, then he'll be okay. He'll wake up. Jesus said plainly, no, Lazarus is dead. He rested in the grave and we rest in the grave until Jesus returns again. We don't go here or there. But Satan will use that misunderstanding of the doctrine to deceive many. Even the secret rapture, another deception. I had done a presentation on this. You can go back and look at it. But because of that, people don't believe that the Antichrist is going to come until they're secretly raptured away. This is not true. Antichrist is here and people are joining hands with the Antichrist because of this false doctrine. We're going to show, and the Bible teaches very clearly, especially in prophecy. That's why prophecy, they're telling us that it's a closed book and we can't understand because the devil doesn't want to himself to be unmasked and revealed. Antichrist is here. It is the papal throne. It stands in the place of God. It is against God. We had covered this, but we'll look at it a little more to make sure that this is so as we look at other um, prophetic chapters in the book of Revelation. And so these things that Satan is using to deceive the whole world, brothers and sisters, it needs to be unmasked. We need to have a correct understanding of the Word of God, that we be not deceived. So let's move forward. Verses 10 through 12. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea. For the devil has come down unto you. The devil is here and so are his angels. And it says, having great wrath, he is angry. He hates God's church. He hates God's true remnant people and especially his law. It says, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. He has a short time, brothers and sisters, and he's seeking to devour all who will stand for that which is right. But it says that we, we can rejoice in the heavens because Jesus shed his blood on our behalf. He gained the victory for us, and so we can rejoice. We can have that, but God is saying, woe unto you. Be ready for these deceptions. Be ready because he's angry, and there's only one way that we can be ready. And we'll look at that. But it's through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, and through the word of their testimony. Brothers and sisters, we are going to have something to say of what Jesus has done for you and for me through the blood of the Lamb. Verses 13 through 15, or through 16. It says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, 
that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So we see here prophecy. They like to repeat and expand. This is just again talking about God's church. This woman, she had to flee into the wilderness, but God prepared a place for her in the mountains and he nourished her physically and spiritually because he was not going to let the light of his word be completely extinguished. But for a time he had to allow the workings of the devil to go forward because he deceived one third of all of heaven, but there were two thirds that still maybe had questions and doubts. Was Satan really right? But they saw what, what he was about when they saw him put Jesus Christ upon the cross through wicked people that cooperated with him. And when he saw the persecution of God's people, it was unmasked to them in heaven who he really was. He was a murderer and a liar. So God had to let this play out. But he had a people, a remnant reserved in the mountains to carry forward his work when he was ready. Now this flood, as I mentioned earlier, he, it was, came out of his mouth. This was all the lies. He was trying to sweep away God's people through the deceptions and through the lies. But it says that the earth helped the woman. The earth opened up her mouth. Now when we look at Revelation chapter 7 verse 15, it says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, this is the false church that stands in opposition to God's true church. We'll get into that in Revelation 17. Where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So waters represent multitudes. This, is, this was considered the dark ages. They were in Europe in different areas where the Catholic church was persecuting them. That's where she sat. But God said, no, I'm going to open up a place to free my people from this persecution. And this place, this earth, if waters represent a populated area, then the earth represents an unpopulated area. And this place, this earth, is none other than the United States of America. God brought his people over here for freedom of religion, to be free from the persecutions of the papal, the papal throne. God said, come here. I have a place prepared for you. And I need my light to be shown again to the world. My people have been in darkness for 1,260 years. I need to open up my word to them again. I need to reveal it to them. I want my people to be ready because Satan has been unmasked. I can come soon, but my people aren't ready. And they weren't ready for a reason. And we'll touch on that in this closing verse. But God opened up the United States of America for us, for freedom. God's people they were protesting. They protested against Rome and the falsehoods that it was teaching. But what has happened? It doesn't seem like anybody's protesting anymore. It seems like they're becoming more and more like the Catholic Church. Those great reformers, they fought against what the Catholic Church stood for. They were part of it at one time, but they got a hold of the Bible and they saw that this is not so. This is not of God. And so God's people need to take a stand. We are living in Earth's final hours. And brothers and sisters, God is calling us to be part of his people, his end time church that will have the light of Jesus Christ. They will have the light of his word. They will be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Righteousness is right doing. It is keeping the commandments of God. Let's look at this last verse. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is this remnant of this, of this church that he is angry with? It says, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These identify God's end time people. They will be keeping the commandments of God, all 10 of them, unaltered 10 commandments, including God's seventh day Sabbath. And so James chapter 2 verse 12 tells us, So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. We are going to face a judgment, brothers and sisters. And this judgment contains the Ten Commandments, or it is God's moral law. That is the standard that we are judged by. 
In James chapter 2, verse 10 says, So for whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of them all. Satan understands that. That's why if he can get you to break one, God's Sabbath, he knows that you violated them all. And that's God's standard. And Satan wants to take as many down with him as he can. So God's law stands as our judgment. And so it is the blood that saves us, but we must know the standard that we are judged by. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 tells us what is this testimony of Jesus? Because they keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. It says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. God's end time church will have a prophet and they will be keeping all ten commandments of God. Now we, I am a Seventh-day Adventist, believe Ellen G. White was that prophet that God had risen up. And God has emphasized his Sabbath because it, it was something that the whole world has forgotten and set aside and many of them innocently. Many have gone to their graves that will be in heaven who kept Sunday as sacred because they didn't know. But now God says, I am going to return, but the world must understand that they are violating one of my commandments. The same as it was in Egypt, when they were slaves for 400 years, they had forgotten God's law. That's why he had to give it to them again on Mount Sinai. It wasn't the first time he gave it to them. They always had that law. Again, God's people were in darkness for 1,260 years. He had to bring the law prominent again to his people. And there were no Seventh-day Adventists early on when they saw that the Seventh-day Sabbath was violated. These were Baptists and Lutherans and Catholics, but they had come to understand the truth of God's word. God unveiled it to them early on. And we see that it took place in the years around 1844. And so God's end time church will have a prophet. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. He needs to be revealed, brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility for those who know, at whatever cost, through the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even unto death. Even if it would cost us our lives, we must stand for the truth. That is what God has called us to do. Verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, shewing himself that he is God. We look back at these two great wonders that John saw, God's true church and the devil that opposes it. There are political things going on, yes indeed. These, those are all part of the winds of strife. But the great battle is that that deals with worship. Who are we going to worship? Satan is deceiving the whole world and drawing them unto himself through this false system of worship. Brothers and sisters, we must be, be victorious. He must be exposed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9-11 through 11 says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, brothers and sisters, he will be able to do miracles. He is going to have signs and lying wonders. These lying wonders are his great deceptions, these false doctrines. It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, but they that might be saved and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Because they had not a love of the truth, brothers and sisters. We need to spend time looking upon the cross that we could receive a love of the truth. And so, brothers and sisters, it is my prayer that you would consider these words carefully. And that if you already know this message, that you would consider studying this matter further to make sure that you are confident of these things in your own heart because we all have a responsibility to take these things to the world and may God bless you to give you wisdom to know how to share may he bless you with love that all that is done in sharing these things will be done in love so there, there would be no excuse to reject them 
And so, brothers and sisters, may God strengthen you. May you find your hope in his cross. And may we understand that the world is not our enemy, but they are God's children as well. He died for them. And so may we seek them. May we love them. May we pray for them. May we encourage them. May we give all that we have for them. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, this great controversy it needs to be exposed. There's so much focus upon politics and vaccinations and all of these things. They are matters of concern indeed, but what's behind it all? Father, I pray that the eyes of the world would be opened up, that they could see. You have people out there. You've said, other sheep I have, not of this fold. Them must I also bring. But how can they see it if we don't share it with them? Lord, give us the courage and the love to do so. May your blessings be upon them. May your blessings be upon your people that we may see you in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for these words of prophecy. Thank you that we can understand them and that these, these avenues of deception that the Satan would, would use upon your people could be exposed, that we would not be deceived, that he could be defeated. Thank you, Father, for your love and your mercy and your long-suffering towards us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.